When you think of military organizations torturing prisoners of war in World War II, it's likely the Soviet NKVD, the Nazi SS and Gestapo, or just the Japanese come to mind. While the techniques of these organizations were often monstrous, and while they sometimes tortured prisoners for means other than to gain crucial intelligence, the Western allies may have had blood on their pliers too. And while no fighting country's record remained untarnished throughout the Second World War, accusations involving Britain, I think, are particularly scandalous given its role as one of the greatest allied powers and its tall moral stature. In this video, we're going to discuss the controversies of Britain's military intelligence section, MI-19, Enemy Prisoner of War Interrogation, with a focus on the controversy of the London Cage, and then consider the morality of torture in general. Before we go ahead, the Geneva Convention was a follow-up to the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, which were deemed lacking after the First World War. The Geneva Convention was made up of a number of articles pertaining to POWs, though it's only important to know that the convention basically set the bar for POW treatment in World War II, and Germany and Great Britain were among those who did sign it, and the USSR and Japan were not. It should be obvious that the Nazis breached the scheisse out of the Geneva Convention, though what about the British and the MI-19? We'll get there, but first, a little on the M-19. So, the Directorate of Military Intelligence was a department of the British War Office, and under the Directorate were many sections. From December 1940 to December 1941, POW interrogation fell to the subsection of MI-19, MI-19A, which was formed thereafter into the new and separate section MI-19. MI-19 kept many interrogation centres both on home soil and overseas, though its most controversial centre stood on Kensington Palace Gardens. Overseeing the interrogations in this inner suburb unit top secret government facility called the London Cage was Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Scotland, to whom much of the prolonged public interest in the London Cage is owed. The use of an inner suburb unit as a temporary internment and interrogation facility may not have been so closely guarded a secret as the torture that purportedly occurred there. While Scotland may have prolonged the public interest in controversy, it was sparked by the Nazi POWs. In war crime trials conducted during and after the war, SS, Gestapo and other Nazi POWs who passed through the London cage claimed that they were tortured at the facility. Among those standing trial were Nazis convicted of murdering and massacring British POWs. And of those, perhaps the most notorious was SS officer Fritz Knuchlein, who was convicted and executed mostly for his role in the Le Paradis massacre of 1940. Also among the Nazis to accuse the London cage of torturing them were SS officer Josef Sepp Dietrich, accused but never prosecuted for participating in the murder of 41 Allied prisoners who escaped from Stalag III, and SS and Gestapo officer Heinrich Hermann August Zacharias, who was trialled and hung for murdering Royal Air Force prisoners in that same escape. Summating the methods of torture to which these and other Nazis claimed they were subjected, they were deprived of sleep, made to stand on their feet for days at a time, made to exercise naked, forced to clean dirty water from their cells and clean the facility's lavatories, forced to excrete in a bucket, which remained in their cells, or in their clothes, which they were forbidden to change, provided insufficient clothing, denied treatment of disease and injury, starved, beaten, sometimes until they begged for death, and tortured with electricity. On top of this, and again, this is what the Nazis on trial claimed, they were drugged, threatened with death and or having their wives deported to Siberia, and forced to confess war crimes for which they had originally claimed innocence. Several POWs committed suicide at the London cage, and others died from illnesses such as pneumonia. Ironically, SS officer Fritz Knuchlein called the MR-19 the British Gestapo. 
With so many Nazi POWs claiming they were tortured, Alexander Scotland himself was put on trial. While the case of Scotland bears contradictory evidence, he claimed his methods of interrogation did not breach the Geneva Convention and refused the accusations held against him, stating he relied on interrogation methods such as cross-examination and non-violence. Scotland was not persecuted. The London cage was closed in 1948, and six years later, Scotland submitted a draft of his personal memoir, titled The London Cage, to the British War Office for review. They ordered him not to publish it and confiscated three of four copies of the memoir. The fourth remained with his publisher, who did not publish it. Now Scotland's actions get a little confusing. In January 1955, seven months after his memoirs were confiscated by the British War Office, he went into the office in person and threatened to publish it. The office responded with a warrant to search his home, confiscating all the information on the London cage he'd been keeping in secret. A deal was brokered, allowing Scotland to publish his memoir after MI5, another section of the Directorate of Military Intelligence, had made redactions. An MI5 document retrieved from Britain's National Archives by Helen Fry, author of The London Cage, The Secret History of Britain's World War II Interrogation Centre, disclosed that Scotland's memoir was confiscated because it revealed precise irregularities in the interrogation of prisoners, disclosed methods used during interrogation, and provided details of infringements of the Geneva Convention. And on the matter, Lieutenant Colonel J. Broughton of MI5 wrote, Scotland's memoir is highly undesirable from the point of view of security. Considering this occurred during the Cold War, the War Office's concerns for British security and international standing were justifiable, though they may also have confiscated the memoir because it may have compromised ongoing war crime trials. A report by MI5 officer Bernard Hill outlining MI5's objections to Scotland's original memoir for the purposes of their agreed upon redaction was also retrieved by Helen Fry. This report identified MI5's objections to the sections of the memoir regarding the ways in which prisoners were disciplined at the London cage, such as how they were forced to clean the facility for three days at a time and forced to stand on their feet for up to 26 hours at a time, and objections to sections regarding incidents of undue pressure, such as how prisoners had their ears boxed, how prisoners were threatened with death if they refused to provide information, and how prisoners were subject to a range of other degrading duties. MI5 also objected to sections of the memoir on how prisoners were forced to confess war crimes for which they had originally claimed innocence. Going off these MI5 documents, the memoir was basically stripped of everything the public could not have learnt by attending the war crimes trials, though for some reason it still contained contradictions. For instance, Scotland stated that while prisoners were not subjected to physical torture, they were subjected to mental torture which was just as cruel. Scotland's heavily redacted memoir, The London Cage, was published in 1957. So, are the claims of Nazi POWs during war crime trials and the two MI5 documents on Scotland's memoir proof that Nazi prisoners were tortured at the London Cage? That as Helen Fry concluded, remains up to interpretation. In truth, there is little evidence on the controversies of the London Cage, with Helen Fry's book being one of the few and perhaps the most comprehensive on the matter. The claims of the Nazi POWs during war crime trials are just that, and the two MI5 documents, interpreting them only through the conclusions of Helen Fry, are pretty vague. That there are contradictions in the redacted version of Scotland's memoir is not conclusive evidence of anything. Indeed, it only adds to the vagueness of it all. Additionally, MI19 themselves never declassified any information on Scotland's case. Scotland's actions throughout the ordeal only attribute to the vagueness. While on trial, he denied torturing prisoners, then he wrote a book, which was confiscated and redacted by the MI5 because it, among other things to which MI5 objected, provided details of infringements of the Geneva Convention, and then he published that redacted version. Why did Scotland write the memoir in the first place, and why else would he have published the redacted version publication if it wasn't for the money? That he published the redacted version leads me to believe it was never about some buried truth, and this weakens the already vague argument that Nazis were tortured in the London cage. Regardless of whether or not POWs were tortured at the London cage, the moral questions still stand. 
Bearing in mind that the Nazis were known for torturing POWs, would you have considered it morally right to torture SS, Gestapo, and other Nazi POWs? Do you think there would have been certain conditions in which torturing them would have become morally right or morally wrong? Again, it's a sensitive topic though, we want to know your thoughts, so please share them down in the comments section below. And just before you go guys, make sure you check out all the links in the description below, including our Instagram and Facebook where we post exclusive content that is not posted on this channel, our Discord where you can interact with other history buffs, and the Patreon if you want to help support the channel more than you already are by watching these videos. If you do decide to donate, you get access to a special behind the scenes Discord where you can see how our whole team operates. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.